Uh, it's, it's not viable. It's not possible because of all the fractures and all the failures in the geology to do that. There's not yeah. enough material in many places to be involved with that. It just wouldn't work for a variety yeah, of reasons. Work. Okay. Now, this well, if it is 30,000 feet, could have caused the same kinds of geological damages all the way down. If yeah. they were to blow something off in shattered geology, what is likely, potentially, to happen, Chris Landau? Well, when you think of these fusing things, and most people have this idea of the fusing of the desert sands when they, they did their initial atomic bomb blast, and all you do is you might fuse a bit of the loose sand to be a couple of inches thick. Yeah, when it was a tiny a amount. Blast, yeah, right. When you let off a bomb blast, you actually break things. I've never known of a decent bomb blast or a bomb blast that didn't break, shatter, break, and smash everything to pieces. Bombs don't seal. They just make bigger cracks and add to the destruction. So I cannot buy, even in thought capacity, using an atomic bomb or any sort of normal bomb to seal anything. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I've heard it said, but bombs don't break. They, I mean, don't seal. They smash everything to pieces. All right. So if we've got a few seeps now, and they're, they're talking about two, maybe three, uh, there could really be 10 or 20. There could be more popping up each day, correct? Yeah, yeah. And, and in point of fact, uh, the geology and the PSI suggests that that would have to happen, does it not? Yeah, yes, it will happen. So as I said, there's a missing 10,000 PSI, which they had when they were drilling. They were mm -hmm. working with at least a 17-pound mud weight and possibly as high as 20. Mm. So there's at least 10,000 pounds per square inch missing, and that's just going out into the formation. So it's going to crack the formation more, create more funneling with the oil and gas through the formation, wear things out more, and uh, erode things away like a high-pressure hose until you've got more destruction and you've got more oil and gas coming up next to the well and in the surrounding fractures around the well. It's just one big ongoing disaster. The amount of oil that actually reached the surface is said to be between 1% and 3%. 97% or thereabout is deep underwater. The dispersant kept it down. Uh, there are enormous plumes of oil down there. Some people are projecting 140-mile-wide uh, plumes, lakes of oil that have been uh, mixed with this corexit, uh, maybe other dispersants, I don't know. But it's not the same. The super tanker, the super skimmer, could not skim the oil because of what the corexit had done to it. That's why that big ship didn't work. The Taiwanese investor was furious. This is a story I read that did not make much news. He, they couldn't get the ship to work because the oil wasn't as it usually is. It had been compromised with the chemicals in the dispersant. So that's another thing. Now, if they light off any kind of an explosive, uh, we all have vivid images of the alleged casing and, and well bore spewing uh, gas and oil out. M you could multiply that by a hundred or a thousand, potentially, if there is a massive cave-in which allows access to the mother load of VOCs, methane, oil, all the gases that are down there, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, this, could be, this could be a world-changing event far beyond that which we have already projected. Uh, is that a, f a fair and safe estimate? Well, I think it's going to get worse and worse as, the, as more oil, oil and gas comes up to the surface, through the fractures. Um, I That's a given, but if they uh, blow it the with something... Mexico being a, yeah. a big mess for a long time yeah. with all the oil and gas they've released. Yeah, that, that's a given, um, Chris, I but if they, if they blow it... In a way Really. I'm sorry. We're breaking up a little bit here. Go ahead, please. Did we lose Chris? Yeah, he couldn't hear me, and it uh, the line dropped off. But uh, we'll get him right back. Keep in mind that any kind of an explosion, as he said very articulately, will 
potentially cave in the whole thing. To one degree or another, it doesn't matter. And then you've got a massive amount of material coming up that would dwarf that 22-inch uh, casing that we saw, which is now capped. And I don't know if if anyone is already in a position to have made a decision to do this, but as you heard Chris say, uh, no way that Relief Well is going to perform as uh, they're pretending to try to describe. All right, we'll be right back in just a couple minutes with Chris. Hang on. Okay, and we're back with Chris Landau. All right, Chris, so any kind of explosion, an explosion of any variety, any type, any shape, any size, could cause a massive cave-in, which could... We remember the pipe, 22 inches, with gases and oil billowing out of it. Allegedly up to 50, 60, 70,000 PSI. I don't know that to be a fact. That was never confirmed, certainly not confirmed by BP. But what could result in addition to the natural seeps, natural, naturally, from the damages that have been done to the earth are going to be coming up, this could be an absolute catastrophe. If they open the door to that that major, massive, somebody calculated it and projected it to be the size of Mount Everest down there of, of, uh, of gas and VOCs and oil, it could never, it could, it could continue for years and decades, and who knows? Um, it also depends on one other interesting thing, which nobody seems to bother to do, and that's whether this oil is is renewable new oil, or is it old oil? Is it abiotic oil, or is it just the normal biological oil that they speak about? You know, the eastern side, the, the Russians from 1950 onwards developed the, um, a good... Um, chemical equations and develop the good thermodynamics to predict that all the oil is actually created abiogenically or inorganically and there are two processes that I presented in my papers to the American Institute of Professional Geologists in October last year where one categorically states that oil, gas and coal is all inorganic and if it is inorganic and being produced from formation, so basically the two syntheses that produce oil are the Fischer-Tropsch process, like the one that they use in South Africa, where they produce 30% of the country's gasoline out of carbon monoxide and water vapor, hmm. which they get, and so they produce 30% of the country's gas there, and that was developed by the Germans in the 1920s and used in the Second World War by them when they couldn't get to the oil fields in Turkey and Russia. They had to produce their own gasoline, so they took carbon monoxide and water and, and pressurized this and made their own gasoline. Hmm. And the other process is called the Wurtz synthesis, and this takes two metal compounds, stitches them together to form an ethane, and they stitch together with another metal to form a propyl compound and a butyl and a pentyl, and so you get the hexyl and cyclohexyl compounds. So you can make oil, gas, and coal inorganically from calcareous formations, carbon dioxide, and methane gas to mm-hmm. make all the petroleum compounds you like. And I mm-hmm. believe that most oil and gas is young, it's five to 50 to 100,000 years old, and it's being made right now. So if it's being generated right now in the presence of hydrogen sulfide in large fracture zones, 
you're not going to be able to stop this because it's being generated all the time. Right. And so your deep wells are a real problem because you, you're tapping into the areas where it's being generated. So there's no such thing as we're going to deplete it. You're not going to deplete it because it's being formed all the time. Correct. And that's a major problem that nobody's tackling and nobody's dating the oil. I would love five universities to go in and date the oil 